So I'm going to uh, talk about the obvious fairly quickly. Uh, that's my unethical reference to past books and forthcoming one. Uh, why this talk? Well, to paraphrase the quote that's already been mentioned, it's not the economy, it's the reality, stupid. So I want to talk about the reality, briefly, of the world that we've pushed past ecological limits, that end endless growth myth still remains in control, and that there's huge ecological ignorance. In fact, George Perkins Marsh wrote Man and Nature in 1864 and almost certainly had a more accurate view of humanity's role in nature than decision makers today, certainly in current governments. Kenneth Boulding talked about planet Earth, spaceship Earth in 1966. Uh, talked to everyone, they do admit we live on a finite planet. Uh, I guess maybe not flat Earth society, but uh, we know the number of people have increased exponentially as has our resource use, and environmental scientists at least know we're beyond ecological limits, but we still deny this. Uh, and therefore, endless growth is the primary and key cause of the environmental crisis. So we are, have obligate dependence on nature. It's not an option. Uh, nature's not dependent on us, and even in some books you'll see about interdependence, which is still not quite right, we're actually dependent on nature. I'm going to go through some of this fairly quickly. I think you all know what a food web is. Uh, also ecosystem realities that we have keystone species that, uh, uh, and people, we have to keep the resilience or stability or resilience in the ecological systems. So what, what's our fair share of net primary productivity, which is the energy stored around the world uh, from sunlight in, in uh, carbon and organic matter? Well, you've got various estimates from the two sex original 40% to 55 to 29, whatever it is, it's a huge amount of that net primary productivity in ecosystems that humans are co-opting and consuming. Uh, so we're 100 times higher than the 96 other highest consuming mammals on Earth. So effectively, we've become an energy vampire on the world's ecosystems, and there's the old Bela Lugosi as one of the... Further. So, briefly, of course, we also have all the great cycles that happen. Uh, I'm not going to go through these in great detail. We've got the nitrogen cycle. We've already heard that it's, uh, natural flux is 110 million. We were some years ago producing 186 so we've, million. We've more than doubled it, and that's having consequences. Phosphorus cycle, again, we've more than doubled it. We've tripled the flow of phosphorus that's going into the sea. We're going to reach peak phosphorus before 2035. Carbon cycle, well, you all know about that in terms of climate change. I don't know, we might even be one of the few conferences that doesn't have a climate change denier here uh, today, um, but I'd be very surprised. If, um, but uh, so ecosystem services, uh, well, the fact is there, the conditions and processes that uh, sustain and fulfill human life, as Gretchen Daly pointed out, they produce their biomass fuels, fibrous medicines, they're the life support functions, but they're essential, but they're still overlooked and denied. And of course, there are also non-material values, which was very nice in Millennium Ecosystem Services pointed out that there's all these uh, non-material values. And there's the beautiful pagoda rock formation on, from the Blue Mountains that I've worked on. Um, so you've seen this slide. I'm not going to go through uh, before, but uh, it's great that they actually had cultural and considered even spiritual values. Uh, ecosystem services. But how many people know that even back in 2005, the 60% overall were being degraded or used unsustainably in the Millennium Ecosystem Services, um, so that we don't tend to think about or value ecosystem services very well. Uh, what the dollar value of nature, I hesitated to put this up, but Bob Costanza said, oh, well, just go for it. So, but he's already pointed, gone through it. Uh, so, but the main point is, you know, if you compare it to the world GDP, well, any sort of estimate you come up with uh, you know, and is more, you know, almost double that. But of course, as Gretchen Daly pointed out, they actually have infinite use value because human life cannot be sustained without these ecosystem services. So is there collapse? Uh, we have a problem of jargon. People call it different, like regime shift or irreversible nonlinear chains. But essentially, we're talking uh, about collapse, and the scale of collapse is far beyond natural processes. Uh, so the world ecosystems changed more in the second half of the 20th century than any other time in human history. Uh, we've already heard a bit about thresholds or tipping points, but we don't know where they are. So there's a major radical uncertainty, and often once a system changes, as we saw with this, which I won't talk about, with a cod fishery, uh, you cannot, in fact, restore it. So is it happening? Well, we just heard about, uh, we know we've got one and a half ecological footprints, and I've still got the old figure for the uh, 
Living Planet report, which is 20% increase now in two years, it's been updated to a 50%. So that gives you a feel for the scale uh, of what's happening. The extinction juggernaut, well, we heard about uh, a thousand times in the Millennium Ecosystem uh, uh, service, uh, report, but uh, Ed, e. O. Wilson pointed out he actually thought it was 10,000 times and that by the end of this century, if we don't change, critical point, if we don't change, half of all life would be extinct by the end of the century. Sadly, Peter Raven, one of the other great biodiversity experts, has done a, in 2011 did another assessment and said, no, it's really not half, it's actually two-thirds. Uh, so that's why we're in the, in the middle of this great mass extinction. And as uh, uh, Michael Sule and Wilcox pointed out, you know, death is one thing, but an end to birth is something else. So if you're wiping out the evolutionary history of half of life on Earth, uh, that's pretty serious. We've heard about this with uh, exceeding limits. So basically, do we have a problem? I don't want to over-press the issue, but you've got all these points. You know, we've increased things multiple, multiple fold. Uh, problem is, you still, why do I have this here? It's because we still get a lot of people who don't believe we have an environmental crisis. So uh, the data is well and, well and truly in. So why are we doing what we do? Teleology, the study of purpose. In a previous age, it was very important to society, as Herman Daly pointed out, but it's almost been forgotten today. So what drives our current unsustainability? Well, part of the problem is we're very obsessed with ourselves now, with anthropocentrism. Uh, so we have a great divide in terms of how we view the world. Uh, the art doctrine of inherent human superiority, superiority, as Taylor put it, or Alien Chris talks about human supremacy, and uh, unfortunately that can also often be within academia, and it's been disseminated around the world by globalisation. Lots of problems with uh, ideology, modernism, just saw nature as a resource, uh, postmodernism, rejected modernism, but still basically that came from, largely from an anthropocentric focus, and you even have some st stretched uh, aspects within that which question whether nature is real or whether it's just actually part of our culture. Uh, denial. Biggest elephant in the room. Uh, denial uh, and uh, it's not scepticism. Skeptics look for the truth. Deniers deny the truth. Uh, it's rampant. It goes back to we don't need wilderness, we don't need natural habitats, we don't need worry about DDT or acid rain. And as Naomi Oreskes pointed out, uh, uh, this ideological aspect that free market equals liberty, so regulation uh, to protect the environment is an attack on liberty and therefore you've got to oppose it along with the science that goes with it. Do we let denial prosper? Well, basically there's all sorts of reasons where we do. I'm not going to have time to go through them. Four elephants in the room. Consumption, over, well, over consumption, overpopulation, climate change and the growth economy. Now, a lot of people in academia talk about, well, which is the bigger elephant, which is more dangerous? But I would ask, which is the least discussed? The fact that this is the first conference ever held in Australia to talk about steady state economy, I would argue that the growth economy is, I mean, at least we talk about climate change now, and we talk about population a bit, where's Dick, 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 <laughs> uh, we may not talk about it enough, um, but um, we don't, certainly don't talk about enough, consumption enough, but we very rarely talk about the growth economy. Um, and which elephant's more dangerous? Well, I pointed to you that if any of them sits on you, you're in real trouble. We have to deal with all of them. So, uh, summarising coming, but believing in seven stupid things. There's probably a lot more. There's Wiley Coyote stepping off a cliff. Um, the world and the universe are about us, as we talked about. Uh, the idea that uh, endless growth is, in fact, praiseworthy. The population's not a problem, as uh, Ian pointed out. Uh, that resource limits are just in our mind, as Julian Simon pointed out, it was referred to, the invisible hand of the markets are God, technology can solve everything, and that greed is good. Um, you've got to laugh. So the evolution of humanity. Uh, so we call ourselves wise man, wise people, homo sapiens, but, you know, are we really homo denialensis? Uh, so without... Okay, stop being negative. <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom. Is there a framework of... Solutions, well, if there is, I mean, there is, <laughs> uh, it's got to be based on accepting reality. So I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't, I call myself a realist rather than an optimist or pessimist. As uh, Joanne Macy points out, um, you know, people, I, you know, sort of say, oh, I'm a realist or I'm an op oh, sorry, I'm a, I'm a pessimist or I'm an optimist. She says, who cares? You've got to be uh, 
a realist and then you take the positive actions that you need for change. So we have to actually consider our worldview, our ethics, our ideologies. We need to stop pre pretending we're masters of nature uh, when we're totally obligately dependent on nature. The scale of the problem, of course, is huge and uh, uh, we have to accept that, uh, but also we have to accept that it's still soluble. We can still solve the environmental crisis and in fact people do need hope, not a false hope based on uh, denial, but uh, an acceptance that there's a huge problem that is still solvable if we all get together. It's a real exciting challenge. <laughs> uh, so we've got to um, roll back the consumer ethic and we have Eric Asadurian from the World Watch Institute who's talking uh, uh, at this conference via um, video talk. Uh, we need to move to 100% uh, uh, renewable energy within a few decades, as I'm sure Mark Diesendorf will be referring to in his talk uh, tomorrow. Uh, we've got to act on population uh, through uh, education, family planning, non-coercive humane strategies. We still get claims that we're talking about mass sterilisation or euthanasia. Well, uh, as the World Watch report in 2012 pointed out with uh, Engelman, uh, in fact, we already know we can do this. Iran was able to halve its uh, population growth rate within a few years. Unfortunately, they then went back to <laughs> increasing it later on. Uh, and we ha a sustainable biosphere is non-negotiable. It's got to be a key focus. And of course, there's a political will for change. And as Thomas Berry, the great uh, theologian, pointed out, this is the great work. This is of sustainability, of actually repairing the earth, moving to a sustainable future. So part of that is uh, a steady state economy, or if you like, a green economy in a steady state economy. UNEP came up with the idea of a green economy, which agreed that it was low carbon and low material uh, use. Uh, great, we all agree we need to do that immediately. But UNEP was very silent about the population issue and the green economy, so we need to then go to a steady state economy where you have a low and ecologically sustainable population and a low uh, throughput of materials and energy. Uh, so that's going to involve degrowth. And a few of our speakers, because I've seen, I'm privileged to have seen most of the video talks, will raise this, that uh, most of the developed countries are in fact too big and need to degrow, whereas there needs to be some further growth for the developing world just for basically fairness, equity reasons. So uh, overall though, our throughput's got to be much lower. And there's various strategies such as factor five, uh, which uh, you could reduce your energy material use by 80% in the developed world if we really try. So I'd say the steady state economy has got to be a key part of this great work. I mean, society really is trapped in a no-win situation. Endless growth doesn't equal sustainability, but it does in the end equal collapse, as Ian's just pointed out, if we continue along this process. And as Jared Diamond pointed out, the uh, all previous civilizations that collapsed were virtually at the height of their power and would have considered collapse an inconceivable. Uh, so we've got to act on population resource throughput. We've got to see all the elephants in the room. We've got to think about ecological reality, the way the world really works. Uh, and that means endless growth is not an option. We've got to break the denial dam. And that means discussing the reality, uh, which is why it's really great to be here today talking about that. Uh, and so hence that conference is a key part of an essential dialogue we've got to have. It's not the only step, obviously. Uh, it's not the first step, but it's one step of many. And I think it's great that we've reached, uh, got a full house here today where we're actually talking about the biggest elephant in the room, I think, that we have to talk about. So I'm, uh, I've gone through fairly quickly my talk to catch up time. I'm going to finish with a couple of quotes. First one is uh, Kenneth Boulding's observation that anyone who believes in indefinite growth in any phys anything physical on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. <laughs> Apologies to the economists in the room. And uh, the other one by inspirational Herman Daly, who sadly couldn't end up producing a video talk for us this, uh, this time for family reasons, that it is widely believed by persons of diverse religions that there is something fundamentally wrong in treating the earth as if it were a business in liquidation. Thank you.